Hello, everybody, and welcome. You're all here for Windows 11, what you need to know, right? <laughs> oh. OK, and hello to everyone in the overflow room. Still a few seats here in case people want to uh, make some, you know, if you're not afraid of sitting up front. Um, for those who don't know who I am, my name is Robert Hammond. Uh, I've been managing Mac since before the days of OS X. And I've been a consultant for 10 years. I worked for the US government. And I currently work for a pretty well-known aerospace firm in the suburban Los Angeles area. Managing Mac OS, iOS, iPad OS, you name it. And we're here to talk about Mac OS 14 Sonoma, named after the wine country. Uh, hopefully, they don't think it's us admins whining about the OS. Uh, and it'll be shipping, it was announced in June, and be shipping this fall. Before we get deep into Catalina, let's take a look at where we were. All the way back four years ago, the last time that I did one of these sessions in person here at Penn State Mac admins, we talked about what was new in Catalina, which was a big revolutionary change because Apple was splitting the file system into OS and application of data. They were also announcing that the endpoint security framework and system and network extensions and kind of getting rid of kernel extensions as much as possible, kind of leading up towards the Apple Silicon uh, release, which came out with Mac OS 11 Big Sur, supporting Apple Silicon. Of course, that gave us some things like volume ownership and concerns with software update. Uh, with that, we got the cryptographically signed system volume. Um, one change in Mac OS 11 and later, it boots from a snapshot, snapshot rather than the entire OS. And of course, the big thing was we went to 11, which broke so many scripts and extension attributes. Because everybody thought in perpetuity it'd be 10 dot something. Uh, in Mac OS 12 Monterey, it was a really good release for us, those of us in IT. It finally gave us erase all content and settings for Mac OS, as well as provisional enrollment of Mac OS computers using iOS Configurator. And then last year, we got Mac OS 13 Ventura, which had a number of features, including platform single sign-on, declarative MDM, we're going to talk pass keys, we're going to talk more about these things in a minute, the uh, much-loved sarcasm system settings app, and uh, I'd even forgotten about login items management, <laughs> which was kind of a, whoa, what are we doing here? Uh, Ventura, though, has been kind of a painful release, at least for a lot of people, particularly around things like deferrals and software update. Uh, I think almost every release version of Ventura has had some comment about improves the reliability of software update. It's kind of like Lucy and Charlie, you know, offering Charlie Brown to kick the football and pulling it away at the last minute. It kind of feels the same. Um, so, you know, we were told that you could run this command, sudo kickstart dash k system slash combat apple dot software update d to restart the software update daemon to try to get it to present updates to the user. Except that doesn't always work. By the way, if you are still programmatically running this command in your endpoints, stop because it can tend to cause more problems than it solves now. Um, I swear to God, I've typed that, <laughs> I've pulled that command to so many people, it's gonna end up on my gravestone. <laughs> One of the things that we got in Mac OS 12 and 13 also was the ability, was in theory, the ability to enforce updates. You could send, use the MDM install later command to tell a device to update and you have so many deferrals. The reality, of course, is that it didn't work very well. There were so many ways to escape those deferrals. So as a result, a lot of people leverage third-party tools like Nudge or Super. Um, deferrals in general were a pain point. <laughs> Apple introduced a new update mechanism, the uh, over-the-air update to go from 12.3 and later, except the deferrals didn't work until 12.6.1 to prevent that. And then there were also other issues with the deferrals. Most recently, the, if you have a deferral profile, you try to install one of the rapid security response updates, you'll get an error. So. Uh, one that I've seen, too, is if you sent the MDM upgrade commands and the user actually upgrades, sometimes they will continue to get update commands even though the, they have installed the update. So you have to delete their library preferences, uh, combat apple at software up plist. Um, there were issues in 13.3 with HDMI output, and smart card and Mac OS 13 has been a royal pain with locking out accounts and forcing rebooting into, into recovery to reset passwords. So this is kind of a visual up representation of the state of software update on macOS today. So thankfully, 
this has been a point of emphasis with Apple. Uh, software update, and, and I, <laughs> I type Ventura, not Sonoma. Uh, it leverages the declarative MDM functionality so that you ac actually can legitimately enforce software updates. Uh, you do that by specifying a local date and time that that device will get the update. That is not the time on your MDM server or on your Mac, it's time on their Mac, wherever they are. Um, that ignores, you know, if the person has do not disturb on and they're in Teams meetings or whatever, they won't get nagged until the last day. And then they will get the notifications every hour. And then they'll get the, the last notification is you're gonna get updated in an hour. Um, you can also include a details URL where people can get more info. You should point it to like a Confluence page or an Apple KB. You know, don't, point, don't Rick roll your users. <laughs> Maybe when you're beta testing you can, but. Uh, and I will say that Tom Bridge in this same room yesterday, uh, if you didn't see his presentation on software update, where we've been and where we're going, highly recommended when the YouTube video is posted. So, uh, some changes in automated device enrollment. In Mac OS 13, Apple added the ability, if a device had been enrolled once, the users could not bypass automated device enrollment. Otherwise, they could just say, I don't have a network, and use the Mac without enrolling it in your MDM. Um, so there was that loophole. Apple has now closed that in Mac OS 14. The user can still say, I don't have a network, but they get eight hours. After eight hours, they get a full screen window popping up that will then, you know, they will have to enroll the device in your MDM. Um, another nice feature, uh, th this is one in particular that, that I've had at my organization, because a lot of times people will pull a Mac off the shelf and not DFU restore it. So they're <laughs> deploying machines to users that are on 13.0 when 13.4.1 is current. So you'll be able to, with Mac OS 14, be able to specify that this device must have a specific MDM version or OS version it, during the setup assistant. And then the device will update and reboot and restart the setup assistant uh, at that time. Another thing, another point, even though you may have a, a profile to enable File Vault, Sometimes that may not get reported back to your MDM, so you can now enforce enabling file vault at your setup assistant. And then one old trick that some of us used to use, this really only worked if your volume wasn't file vault encrypted, was to remove the private var db apple setup done and reboot the Mac to get it to go in the setup assistant. Doesn't work anymore. Okay, another big change in Sonoma. Managed Apple IDs. Managed Apple IDs were uh, available, or they primarily were used for educational market. To let users sign in, multiple users sign into iPads, maybe use iCloud Drive for storage. They didn't offer a lot of functionality. They were very, they're pretty much useless in enterprise. You couldn't do anything with e-commerce. You couldn't use any of the continuity features. Um, so they've changed that now. You can leverage iCloud Keychain, Apple Wallet, Sidecar, continuity camera, universal control, and so on. And you can also have developer accounts be managed Apple IDs. Um, Apple Business and School Manager have some additional functionality where you uh, can you know, control whether these managed Apple IDs can be used to sign in uh, to any device or just devices that are managed, which could be a personal device, or devices that are supervised, which would be you know, an MDM controlled device. Uh, you can also allow messages or calls uh, you know, on these devices with those Apple IDs with anyone or the organization only. I'd like to see these Apple Business Manager give you more control over what features managed Apple IDs could offer. So that's feedback time for Apple. Cooking a little bit here. Okay, another thing that Apple's added is OpenID Connect. Um, and this goes around to federating the Apple Business Manager. Sorry, hang on one second here. To federating Apple Business Manager with Azure with things like Azure AD. That's what Apple offered initially. They only did it with commercial. However, so if you hear Azure AD or or now Entra ID was in like say a, a a high security tenant, FedRAMP tenant, uh, you wouldn't be able to federate. Apple later added Google Workspace, but the problem was here is that Apple had to do all the work. 
So there's actually a standard federation called OpenID Connect that Apple can and has allowed people to, you know, other Apple, Apple you know, it's a Microsoft standard that Apple is also working with. They're going to support it in Apple Business Manager. This basically puts the, the, the work on the identity provider vendor, the Octas, Pings, whoever of the world, to add additional federation capability to, to Apple Business Manager. Uh, it does require them to support the OpenID shared singles framework. So for example, if you change your password on the identity provider, that Apple Business Manager knows that there was a password change. Uh, declarative device management, we could talk, spend the whole conversation talking about declarative. You can think of it as MDM refactored. When you think about MDM, it was designed in 2008 when servers were powerful and clients weren't. And of course, you know, you've got an Apple Silicon Mac and you know, M2 Max, Pro, Ultra, whatever, you know, you've got a pretty powerful machine. So the, the whole point of declarative is that you end up with the clients doing more of the work and the clients being a little more autonomous. You know, you say to a client, file vault shall always be on. User somehow uses FDC it up, FDE setup to disable file vault. Declarative will come say, oh, this file vault's supposed to be on. Let me go turn it back on. Things like that. And there's also a, a status channel where a lot of things are reported. You know, if it, you upgrade your OS on a device, you may be dependent upon that device to do an inventory update or a check-in to report its status. But with declarative, it'll actually report, I've updated the OS. It also allows you to do things like pre-stage settings, on, you know, for a new iOS ver or Mac OS version that aren't supported on the current one, because they're only, they're, with traditional MDM, when you push a profile device, that profile is evaluated at installation time only. So there's some more intelligence there. One of the new features in declarative management in Mac OS 14 is, you can, is ways to manage apps, updating, installation, uh, and deletion. And this should help improve the VPP experience in Mac OS. As good as VPP works on iOS and iPadOS, it does not on macOS. As anybody who's ever tried to deploy Xcode to a fleet of people will report. Um, also, so for those who have to deal with configuration management, a lot of times on macOS, this is my experience in the government space, I had to do a lot of management of uh, things like the SSH config, and the SSHD config, and so on. So I would either use Puppet to control that, or I would actually have to package the files up and then deploy them you know, to the endpoints. And that was challenging. So declarative in macOS 14 now supports things like setting the SSH, SSHD, sudo, PAM, cups, Apache, C shell, and bash. Uh, so for those of you who are really frustrated about the fact that every time you install a macOS update and you lose touch ID until you edit your PAM.d file, you can fix that now with declarative. Uh, the two things that I have to update that are not listed in the documentation are NTP and NSMB configuration files, so maybe that'll get added in a later version of declarative. Um, Rich Troughton is actually doing a declarative MDM presentation right now, so, this is, so that's one, another one that you should keep an eye out for. Okay, platform single sign-on. The idea behind this is that you could authenticate and log into your Mac using an identity provider. The Mac would not have a local account and would be dynamically created. Except the first version of platform SSO didn't actually create the account, let you create the accounts on the fly. So that is now addressed in Sonoma. There are multiple identity providers, JumpCloud, Okta, et cetera, that are working on this. Microsoft has their own platform SSO in private beta. If you send a lot of money to Microsoft, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to loop you into it if you're a Microsoft shop. Um, some nice new restrictions pro uh, payloads in Mac OS 14, uh, including the ability to restrict local users. So, you know, one of the concerns with giving people admin access is they could do other things on that system and like create an account for their wife or their kid. I see this all the time. So being able to block people from creating new accounts is a nice feature. Account modification, things like uh, using in internet accounts to add a personal email account to a device or, you know, Apple ID sign-ins, uh, change the device name. Joe's MacBook Pro, nope, sorry, we're gonna fix that. And also being able to adjust the startup disk, which is another way to exfiltrate data. They're in high security environments, you do not want people to have access to enable time machine, which is another thing that you control, or startup disk. Um, Apple has also noted that each, every MDM vendor has their implementation of like an internal app store. For Jam people, it's self-service. For Intune people, it's company portal. 
uh, Apple has built some functionality in to make it easier for them to have a better experience with it. One of the challenges with like VPP app deployment on Mac OS, for example, is deploying Xcode. If you put Xcode in Jamf Pro self-service, you click install, it takes a, like five seconds and says, I'm done. So the user looks in their applications folder and says, hey, I don't get Xcode. So they go back and do it again, three, four times. You look at the MBM command history in the device, you see duplicate command, duplicate command. And then the user opens a ticket, hey, I didn't get Xcode on my Mac. And of course, by the time somebody gets back to them, in the background, the wheels have turned, it's finally installed. So it is not a great experience. So the hope is that, you know, I haven't tested this personally, but the hope is that with Mac OS 4, you know, 14, that we will see a better experience for installing some of these larger VPP apps, as long as the developers, of course, support this. Uh, some changes to Safari, you can create multiple different profiles that have different extension settings, uh, could have their own different cookies and things like that, so you can have a work profile, a home profile, a social media profile, and so on. Uh, you can also have a web, play, have a web page displayed as an application in your dock. Uh, it's more than just a web clip, like you see on iOS. Um, I haven't tested that too much with enterprise apps. The one thing that is still missing with Safari, however, is the ability to manage extensions. You can do that with Chrome. You can't do it with Safari, which is why a lot of enterprises don't deal with Safari at all or don't support it. Pass keys. These are, this is basically the replacement for passwords, certificate based. And it's something that Apple and Google and Microsoft are all behind. Apple introduced this in Mac OS 13 and it was fine. What's that? Sure. Um, Apple introduced pass keys in Mac OS 13 designed to replace passwords. And again, this is, a, this is an industry standard supported by all the major players. The concerns with enterprise with the first version, of course, were that it required iCloud keychain. So if you're leveraging managing app, managed Apple IDs that didn't support iCloud keychain, yet you need this for Apple, for pass keys, you needed to enable people to log in with non-managed Apple IDs, which then opens the door up to the password being shared. What would stop me from sharing this webmail password with my wife who cannot log in my work e account and read email? So pass keys had some issues. So both of these things are now addressed. Okay, big one. For those in highly regulated environments or in government space is logging. Audit D, uh, the, the log framework in Mac OS is deprecated. And Apple is making noise about potentially removing it in a mid-cycle update, just like they did with Python. Um, if you, matter of fact, a new Mac OS 14 system will ship with Audit D disabled by default. You'll have to enable it if that's important for your environment. The endpoint security framework, which was introduced in Mac OS 10.15, has been announced as the replacement for Audit D. Unfortunately, it doesn't do everything that Audit D does. So there is a feedback, which we'll talk a lot about feedback in a minute, in the Mac OS security compliance channel that, uh, you know, to make sure that they are functionally identical before Apple pulls it. And hopefully not until Mac OS 15. So we have a little bit more time, but we'll see. Uh, Apple also redesigned the login window. It's a little bit controversial and it's changing over the OS releases. If you care about what the, the wallpaper is, for example, behind your login window, you've got a lot of testing ahead of you. Um, there's also, if you have devices that you need to, you know, like a kiosk that you need to auto log in, there are MDM keys that specify that login, auto login, username, and password for like a service account that could be used to log into that system. Um, something else that changes password policy, local password policy in macOS. In my time in the government space, I couldn't actually use a profile to deploy passwords because it wouldn't give me enough control. So I actually had to like use the PW policy command to set a password policy, but I'd rather use a profile. So they've added it now so they can support regular expressions or regex. Um, if, the policy, if the password policy has changed, the user is notified. It doesn't just lock the user out of their account, which it could do under certain circumstances previously. And the user is prompted to update their password to a new one that meets the, the new requirements. Okay, here's another big one. Managed device attestation. Um, this is basically saying that this device is in fact owned by your org. How does it know this? Well, you can query the, you know, basically it's storing, it's, it's when, it's, it's how you get certificates. So how many people are familiar with the concept of SCEPT or as if you're a Microsoft shop, where, you know, you set a certificate request 
and you get a cert and a private key back. Um, the way this works is slightly differently in that it uses a private key that's stored in the secure enclave of your Mac, so it has to be a newer Mac. Um, and it will then submit that cert request and get the certificate back, but the private key is still stored in the secure enclave and can't be exfiltrated. Uh, there's also status information about the secure en enclave and things like system integrity processing and stuff like that. OS version, the secure enclave enrollment ID, so that, it, so that the MDM can make sure the device is actually your device and not one that's been tampered with. Because how many people have had this where you need a certificate to log into your VPN and users are smart enough to figure out how to export that cert if you don't create the profile correctly and put it on their personal Mac and now their personal Mac and VPN into your network. Not something you really want to do. Speaking of VPNs, uh, another new thing that Apple has announced are relays. And what these are, it's a VPN alternative. So the way the VPN works is, you know, if I have a VPN on my iPhone, I can connect to my, you know, and the right certs and everything, I can connect to my work network. Now my device exists on the network and has full access. So if my device is compromised, guess what? Whoever's compromised this device now has full access to every system on the network and can laterally move. So the concept behind a relay server is that you, again, you leverage something like the managed device attestation to confirm that the device can, uh, you know, the device is yours, and you give it access through the relay server to just the particular server it needs. So if you need somebody needed access to Jira, your Jira or Confluence instance, they could just use relay. So their entire device is not getting in your network. Their entire device is only getting through that relay server to the host, like a pro like a reverse proxy. So as far as I know, the only vendor that's working on a relay server today is Cisco, and the standards are kind of evolving, but I would expect a lot of people to move for this. And it's kind of another step in the, uh, you know, in, into the whole change you know, to more of a controlled access to your network. Uh, some changes for Configurator on both macOS and iOS. Configurator on macOS now supports shortcuts that allow for additional workflow automation. Some of you may have worked with Apple provisioning utility in the past. I think this might be a replacement for it. Not sure. Probably has some growth to do before it gets there. Um, also, iOS configurator, if you use that to add Macs or iOS devices to your Apple business or school manager account, you can now sp assign them to a specific MDM server if you have multiple. So you don't have to get it into the MDM and then log into Apple business manager and move it to where it needs to be. You can do it right away from the beginning. Another security improvement. Um, Talk about app application sandboxing. Uh, you've heard the expression, go play in your own sandbox. So sandbox applications basically define, these are the areas of the system, these are the files that I touch, and they have their own user folder structure in, but for preferences, for example, in your library containers or library group containers folder. Um, and that prevents them from being able to reach outside of those areas they've defined to the system. On the other hand, there was nothing preventing a non-sandbox app from going in and reading an application's data. Well, there is now, so that's restricted by default in Mac OS 14. Uh, and you will need a privacy preferences policy control profile to allow a, you know, a, a certain processor device. What this is likely to affect is you have to want to test things like Microsoft auto update or, or auto update, you know, applications that update other applications, things like Monkey. You know, I think full disk access will also give them, if you give that process full disk access, It'll be success successful for this, but you may want to get more surgical or granular with the controls that you give out. Um, and I have not found a way to test this, but purportedly, this is one of my biggest frustrations in macOS. How many times has this happened to you? You're in the middle of typing a password, and all of a sudden, an application jumps focus forward. You know, you're typing a password in terminal or something, and an application jumps forward, and you're like, where was I? I was typing my password. <laughs> Frustrating. So there's supposed to be some mechanism to prevent the context switching when you're actively typing text. I haven't found a way to test this yet, but I'll buy whoever, if this actually does work, I'll buy whoever implemented that feature at Apple a really nice steak dinner. So how do we get Mac OS 14? Well, in the past, we used this lovely little command line tool called seedutil, where we could pick a seed. And Apple has deprecated that or removed it. Um, the legal team got involved in, in Mac OS 13.4, you know, and I think it was iOS 16.5. They added the ability to sign in to the beta program in, the, uh, in your software update system settings. There are three paths to get the beta. Uh, if you're an develop Apple developer, of course, you can get it. Uh, that comes out, of course, right away on the day of the WWDC keynote. 
Uh, also, if you were to, um, you know, if you were to wait until July, you could sign up for the public beta, which just came out, I think, last week. But what everybody here should be using is Appleseed for IT. Unfortunately, you can't, as an, as, a man, as an admin, you can't push a profile device that forces, like I can only sign into this developer profile with a manager's ID. You can't specify a beta program. So of course, the first people on 13.4 that I needed to install the betas on, one of them picked developer, one of them picked public. So one of them got 14, the other one got 13.5 betas. So that, it would be, you know, so it's a, it'd be nice. So what's the Appleseed, uh, Appleseed for IT webpage? Appleseed.apple.com slash IT. And you'll sign in with your Apple business or school manager managed app, Apple ID account. On that page, you will find the what's new PDF from uh, Apple, as well as test plans for both Exchange and the new software update functionality. And then recent, fairly recent edition, which is really nice, which I would have loved to have showed you a screenshot, but I was denied, uh, is they have a testing template, Excel document, that helps you you know, identify like who's your MDM provider, have you tested this, have you tried this, have you tried upgrading a device, have you tried enrolling a device, and so on. So these are actually really nice. Highly recommend checking it out. The betas come out on average about every two weeks. Uh, we, got a, we got a second beta of beta three last week, which I think was just a way to avoid dropping a beta here. Well, a lot of people from Apple are at the conference and a lot of admins. So. Uh, and if you're on Mac Admin Slack, which everyone should be on Mac Admin Slack, the hashtag Apple Dev RSS channel will notify you of new Apple beta and production releases. You will also want to pay attention, once the updates are released, to the Apple C, to the, there is a private Apple C channel. It's not public because of Apple's NDA. So you have to join the hashtag Apple C channel for information about how to get access to the private channel, and someone has to grant you access. They basically need to make sure that you actually have an Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager account, so you're part of the beta program. And respect the beta. Don't be posting screenshots or blogs talking about bugs or features in the new OS that aren't cover already covered by Apple. Uh, these betas will keep coming out through the cycle. Uh, you'll want to be having some conversations with your MDM vendor. If something like Acme is important to you, you want to talk to your MDM vendor and says, hey, when are you going to offer Acme support for macOS in your product? Kind of base it on that. Maybe, they have, you know, maybe they'll have a test environment that you can use and roll a device in to test some of that stuff before you know, upgrading your production environment. Um, it goes without saying that if you're trying to manage a device, a macOS or iOS or iPadOS device today without an MDM, I don't know how you're doing it. So, and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. So when it comes to testing, and this advice comes straight from Eric Boyd at Apple. Who Eric is one of, our, one of the people who was in our community and has now joined the mothership. He said, the best time to test is immediately after WWDC announcements. Why? Because that's when the developers are most attuned to feedback. They have the most amount of time. Because as time goes on, their focus is either on fixing the bugs they know about and getting, the, getting their part of the thing done so they can like go on vacation or whatever, or they may actually be pulled into another project, start working on Mac OS 15. So the best time to begin testing Mac OS is right away when it's announced. The second best time to begin is now. So if you haven't installed a beta on a machine, you'll want to do that soon. Maybe not here at the conference with the Wi-Fi, but... Uh, <laughs> And, you know, again, it, it's, fair, it's a lot easier for them to change course earlier in the cycle than later. The whole login items thing last year was a big surprise, even to some people at Apple. And that required a big pivot on their part to support suppressing those login item notifications and allowing, blocking the user from turning off login items. Uh, it goes without saying that you need to be testing beta releases, not just in that June through October time frame, but also other, you know, Apple has a tendency to drop surprises, like pulling Python out in 12.3. So you should be, you know, if you get on the beta cycle on your device, you might want to stay on the beta cycle on that device. One thing I will say, too, is that uh, Ventura has been one of the more stable betas in beta 1. Catalina beta 1, I wouldn't have wished on anyone, even if I hated them. So how do you test? Well, virtual machines used to be the way, but there's a couple challenges with that. Number one, Apple's virtualization framework doesn't support assigning a serial number to device so you could test automatic device enrollment. So one of the big points of testing 
is making sure that you can enroll devices. You need to do that with physical hardware. Uh, Apple ID sign-ins on VMs is also problematic. And what is required to sign up to get a device in the beta program now? An Apple ID sign-in. Some people have figured out some workarounds for that that may work, it may not work over the long term. Probably best to find an alternative approach. Uh, if you do want to, there are things like uh, you know, Mac UT, or, you know, UTM app for creating virtual, virtual machines. You can, if you just want to get experience with the user interface without actually testing like your enrollment and enrolling your device in MDM and things like that, that's fine. But you'll want to do physical hardware. And the new MacBook Airs, since they're nice and small and really powerful, are really great. Um, erase all content and settings is your friend. So is using a DFU restore. Uh, the, the trick with DFU too, when you're trying to do restores on the new betas, whatever device you're restoring from, not to from, you need to install the Xcode beta on so you make sure you have all the right mobile frameworks for the new OSs. And again, uh, the UTM app, and you can get the IPSWs from the Appleseed portal. So who should be testing? Well, in my organization, uh, we immediately we started talking with a lot of the other endpoint engineers, people in the endpoint team, uh, other IT people, InfoSec people. Who, and we didn't, so, some people we volunteered, some people we asked for. You do need to find testers in your community. This is, this is more of a, uh, this is more of an art than a science. You need to find users who are going to be okay with stuff not working, with being broken. People who can communicate well. Um, you, you, need a, you need a wide variety of people to do your testing because people in different groups, you know, you want everybody from, you know, executive support, executive secretary, software development, you know, InfoSec, IT. Make it easy for them to get the betas. If you have anything blocking beta installation, you need to have a separate profile that allows it and be able to swap those out. Um, Again, with, with being able to sign into these betas, people need a managed Apple ID. Well, so what if some of these people don't have a managed Apple ID? They don't work with Apple Business Manager. You can create a staff account in Apple Business Manager. The staff account basically just associates that user, if you're not federated, you can make sure that that user has access to sign in to the beta program. They do need to sign into the Apple Seed IT site and accept the terms and conditions, however. Because uh, I had that problem too, where I created a managed Apple ID for somebody, and I'm like, hey, it won't let me sign in. Uh, go to the app, go to the here, sign in now. Oh, I got to agree to the agreement. Okay, can you sign in now? Yeah, yeah, that worked. Again, things you don't know until you run into them. So what should you start testing? Well, the first thing I typically do is I will pick a Mac, maybe not my daily driver, but another one that I've got. And it's already enrolled my in functional. I don't have any problems with it. If I'm having, if it's got issues, let me do can pave it on the current OS before I update it. Upgrade that enrolled Mac and then test it. Then, when you're ready, test enrolling. This is where you'll likely find things that are wrong and correct. I had one scoping issue with a policy that ran that had a script. There were two versions of the script because the curl command changed in between Mac OS 10, 15, and 11. So I had one that said this works in Mac OS 11, 12, and 13. What did it not work on? 14. What did I do? I took out the whole version restriction because I don't have any 10 systems to worry about anymore. So you'll find stuff like that that's just cruft. Um, you'll want to test your application suites, Office or whatever you use, you know, your AV, internal tools, websites, your self-service company portal. You want to find others in your organization to help you with that because not everybody uses the same applications at the same level. I use Excel differently than people who are in finance. Do the applications launch? Do they function correctly? Can you print? You know, can you like identify some of the custom apps you use, or like you know, so you're having a problem with with, with particular apps, like you know, okay, Adobe apps are having cr crash problems. Who's our who deals with Adobe? You know, can we talk to them and find out what when they're going to support this and so on? And again, come up with your own internal test plans. You can base them on the Apple examples. So, yeah, to paraphrase, uh, I got a fever, and the only prescription is more feedback. This is what Apple wants from us. The one takeaway you get from this thing today is submit feedback to Apple. And we'll go over that in detail how. Feedback is how you tell Apple that something isn't working or functionality is missing. Like, for example, the missing Audit D function in Endpoint Security Framework and why Audit D going away is a problem for your organization. 
File your feedback early and often. Uh, if you're an organization that also has Apple Care Enterprise, it is recommended that you both you file feedback first and then duplicate that same text for Apple Care Enterprise. The Apple Care Enterprise part comes in, into play, particularly if you've got a deployment blocker, which we'll talk about. So how do you file feedback? Well, the feedback exist, uh, assistant app lives in your system library core services applications folder. You can just command space spotlight, type feedback, hit return, it'll open the app. You can also go to feedbackassistant.com or you can use the URL format apple feedback colon slash slash, which will open up the feedback assistant. Okay, the big takeaway. It is really important when you sign into feedback assistant or the, or the feedback assistant website, what are you signing in with? your managed Apple ID. Why? If you sign in with a developer ID, that feedback goes to the developer team. Public beta goes to another team. Managed Apple ID that's used with Apple Business or School Manager goes to the enterprise team at Apple. Nothing worse than filing feedback and it getting totally ignored because it went to the wrong team, which you didn't even know. So when you look in Feedback Assistant, you will see you will have a personal item and you will have your company, which I've truncated the company name on mine. Make sure you send it as your company. And I'll hold my hand up and say, I have sent it personally accidentally because I didn't check where I was doing and I had to like, Arr. they don't make it easy to copy paste the stuff over either. The big questions. First of all, when you provide feedback, keep in mind a human is reading this, not a robot. So don't express your frustrations. Jesus, Apple doesn't get enterprise, I don't understand. You guys are idiots. No, don't do that, don't do that. Be nice, be, be clarity. What were you trying to accomplish? What did you do? What did you think would happen? What actually happened? You know, what do you think should have happened? Send any screenshots, videos, logs, cyst diagnosis, whatever. They can all be helpful. If something is a particular deployment blocker to your organization, like, hey, you're gonna pull Audit D, I can't have Macs at my, in, in government. That's when you get Apple Care Enterprise involved. That's when you get your system engineer involved. They have an escalation path for some of these things. So this is an example of feedback that I wrote. I deal in an environment where there's a lot of Windows PCs. There's over 100,000 Windows format URLs, backslash, backslash, domain, backslash, server, on our confluence. So the, the new Mac user at the organization sees that, copies that, we go to server, paste it in there, and it doesn't connect. OK, well, you got to like, change the format of the slashes the other way and put it. This is a computer. Why can't it do this for me? Why doesn't it just do it in the OS? So I created feedback to do this. If anybody wants to dupe it, by the way, it's 12181533. I doubt, I doubt they'll do it, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. An important thing with feedback, anytime a new beta is released, if you've submitted feedback on something and test it again. If it still doesn't work, submit new feedback. When you're going through your enrollment testing, you need to make sure that you need to be able to, to, to look at what, what is the end state of this enrollment. So you need to document that process. So when you're doing the testing, you can document your enrollment process and then compare. Why should you be testing Sonoma now? Well, again, the earlier you get feedback to Apple, the more, the, the sooner they can address issues, like the whole login items thing we saw in Mac OS 13. You may also find issues that are exclusive to your environment that Apple wouldn't know about. But you can point them to and say, hey, this is a real problem for us that I can't use an NFC YubiKey on an iOS 16 device and hope that they fix it. Uh, try to be ready to support by release date, if at all possible, because deferrals were a major pain point in Mac OS 13. And also, being able to support that new OS means that when Apple releases new hardware, you can support it, because the new hardware will often require the latest OS. Um, at some point, Apple stops ship, you know, maybe if they don't change the hardware, like within a month or so of releasing the OS, Apple will ship the device with Mac with Mac OS 14. While it is technically possible to downgrade a Mac that could run 13, back to 13, it is not recommended. The things like firmware and so on. So, you, you know, you're really tilting at a windmill trying to defer updates. So, we've kind of had to undergo a change 
in the way that we handle security due to the nature of zero, there's zero days every day in various products. So previously, and I've been in you know, my consulting days, it was a whole, you know, we do patches once a month or the patches have to go in front of a change control board and we have to have a backout plan and you don't really back out of a Mac OS update. Uh, you can, we can with a rapid security response update, but not an actual full update. Um, so we've kind of pivoted from that approach to the updates out, update ASAP, hopefully within the week or whatever, or force the update. Apple, um, it's not, you won't find them say this anywhere. Apple tends to provide security updates for not only the current OS, but the previous two. So right now, 13 is getting updates, this is 12, it is 11. When 14 ships, 11 falls off, it will no longer get updates. However, Apple does not backport all security fixes to the older OSs. And there's actually, they actually posted that finally, and I th think it's their macOS security uh, page. So if you want, you know, the most secure OS is the latest OS. So if you want the most secure Mac, you must be running the latest OS with the latest app updates. So what Macs run Sonoma? Well, it's pretty much anything 2019 and later, maybe the 2018 MacBook Pros. Uh, the iMac Pro is a 27, late 2017 system. Uh, the, the 2019 iMac doesn't have a secure enclave, so I don't think you can use Acme with it, but it still at least runs the OS. I don't know how much longer we have uh, with Intel machines, but <coughs> while you're also doing your testing, I highly recommend, you can download this tool from Appleseed for IT as well. It's called Mac Evaluation Utility. This is essential for any business that has firewalls because people with firewalls and proxy servers love to inspect traffic and things, and those will break Apple updates. So if hosts are blocked, and the other thing too is that you, know, you tell your firewall team, we need to open these hosts to Apple. So they'll block, they'll open up Apple's entire 17 address after much grumbling except Apple uses Akamai for caching, which isn't in that address group. So if you don't actually go through and have the ability to uh, you know, allow by domain, and there's a support article down here at the bottom of the page that covers the, you know, this is use Apple products enterprise networks. The MEU leverages the same services and hosts as that. So what you ideally want to see, of course, is all green. You see anything yellow in here or red, then your network engineers have some work to do. Major OS updates are also a good time to evaluate your environment. Are you still binding to AD? Why? Labs should be testing the platform SSO from Microsoft as a replacement. I don't think AD is going to be around for much longer in Mac OS. Plan for future changes. Are you happy with your security tools? Has your security vendor been on the ball with supporting the new OSs by the time Apple releases, or are they like two, three months behind? Uh, the recommendation is that you keep those contracts with security vendors down to a year so that they always have to prove themselves and allows you to pivot to a different tool if they end up not supporting your OS. If you're in an environment where you have in like a school or an office where people, a lot of people are there and they're on the corporate network, if you don't have a caching server, set one up. This is when I set up a caching server for the first time. This was three days. And you see it's, it uh, pulled 143 gigs from Apple, but it, say it served 858 gigs from the cache. That's a lot of bandwidth across a lot of sites that was saved by having the caching server. It's really easy to set up a caching server too. You can do it via MDM. So if you've got a Mac mini somewhere in your network, like in a lot of our environments, we have help desk technicians with Mac minis that are used to like nuke and pave iPhones and Macs and stuff like that. So why not set it up as a caching server in their environment? And again, I'll go back to this point about deferrals. I, th I think trying, you know, a Apple, we used to be able to block software updates in perpetuity. Then we got deferrals that we could go out, you know, 30, some up to 90 days, stuff like that. But Apple really wants Mac OS to follow the iOS and iPad OS model. If you look at the uh, OS adoption for consumers, for example, most people update their devices, you know, they're on the latest OS within a month or two of it releasing. That is definitely not the case on Mac OS. So they're trying to get people to, they're trying to get, you know, they cut that window down from perpetuity to 90 days, but even still, it's been problematic. So I got 99 Mac OS problems, but the deferral profile ain't one, son. I did not, have not used a deferral profile for a couple of years on both Mac OS and iOS, and I have not been bitten by all these deferral issues with Mac OS. While you're also evaluating things, if you haven't heard of the Security Compliance Project, um, they had a workshop here the other day. Um, this is basically a, an open source tool that lets you evaluate 
your current security configuration against existing NIST and DISA standards, or you can make your own standards. Because a lot of these standards and recommendations are just recommendations. You know, if you were to apply all those recommendations, you would have an absolutely brick computer that you couldn't do anything with. You know, like, what good is an iOS device if I can't take screenshots on it? You know, that's one of the mistakes for that. It's like, so no, no, not in our environment. Set up your own standard. But this will actually help you because it'll build configuration profiles and scripts, audit scripts, and implementation scripts for you. So um, the workshops aren't recorded, but I do know they're going to have some documentation on it. There's all, Apple also has a video. If you talk to your Apple SE, they can link you that video. It's on, hosted on an IBM site. So when is Mac OS 14 going to ship? Well, you know, our OS releases are typically in the fall. So the last couple of years, we've been in the late October time frame. I would guesstimate we're looking at the same thing. And normally, again, we'll get a major release at this point in time, and then it'll be with like 30 days or so, we'll see the point one update. And then about every 45 to 60 days after that will be another update. And usually that dot three or dot four update has new additional features that you have, or functionality or changes that you need, significant enough that you should pay attention to. Overall, I think the future is bright uh, for Apple. Uh, for example, you know, even though, you know, a lot of people bought hardware at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, that's three years now. Um, you know, some people have switched to mobile devices entirely. So you know, the, the computer market itself is decreasing, but Apple's share of that market is actually increasing. The only one that's going up. Uh, Apple has definitely increased their focus on enterprise security and privacy. I don't know if you could tell, the whole sum of changes, there's a lot of, there's some big changes and some little changes in Mac OS 14 designed to lock the, make, you know, make Mac OS more secure for enterprise adoption and reduce some of the concerns over things like pass keys and so on. Um, and you know, in a lot of different environments, Apple, Apple environments are increasing faster than the company size. So you're seeing more and more people coming out of college or switching jobs who are familiar with a Mac, want to use a Mac, your organization has to support it. So uh, I do have some additional resources. The slides will be available, so you don't need to worry about taking these. But uh, there are five WWDC sessions that are extremely relevant. What's new in managing Apple devices? Uh, do more with managed Apple IDs and explore advances in declarative device management. Also deploying pass keys at work. And then the ready, set, relay, protect app traffic with network relays. There are several blog posts from Jamf going over WWDC, Apple in the Enterprise, Apple in Education, shared iPad in Business. Then there's also Simple MDM is a really nice blog post. Kanji's got a bunch of blog posts, including some on testing and on device enrollment changes. And Sentinel One also has a blog talking about toughening up Mac OS for the enterprise. Uh, besides that, we have the Apple documentation links for the platform deployment guide. You should be looking at that, and as well as the what's new in Apple platform deployment. Also the platform security guide, which you should share with your InfoSec people, and the document history, which shows the revisions. Uh, the Apple Sonoma preview page, which goes over more of the consumer features of the OS. And again, I'm going to repeat this because it's really important to use Apple products and enterprise networks. I think I will also die with that embedded in my brain, that URL. So some thank yous to the folks at Penn State, past and present, who have helped put on this conference physically and virtually for the last decade. Uh, to the Apple people who are, used to be sysadmins and part of our community who have now been assimilated by the mothership and are working hard to help us out. I hope you're seeing the results of their efforts in these OS releases in the last couple of years. Uh, also to the folks who contribute on Mac admin Slack, Jamf Nation, Reddit, Mac sysadmin, GitHub, and their personal blogs. You know, if you figure something out, you can blog it and help save somebody else's time, and they'll be very appreciative for it. You might even buy you a beer while you're here. And thank you again to you for attending this conference in person or watching the presentation on YouTube. I suggest you find a way to give back to the community by joining these communities, posting something, posting a blog. Medium is free. Word, a lot of WordPress you can set up for free and so on. If you've learned something, don't hesitate to share it. Nobody's going to be, well, that's not actually true. People, if you find somebody who's like that, let, let an admin of Mac admin Slack know. I also want to give a shout out to somebody who's no longer with us, uh, from my former colleagues at David Hester, who was here at uh, the last in-person PSU. OK, and that's the end of my formal presentation. Does anyone have any questions?
can a caching server be configured to tolerate or work with external storage? I think so. The question was, could a cache, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot the cache box. The question was, can a caching server uh, be leveraged with external storage? And I, th I think the answer is yes, but I'm not sure, certain. I, th I, I have not done it because I've basically bought, you know, one terabyte SSD machines. Yeah, the oh. Watch your drinks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, with the managed Apple IDs, uh, we tried to institute them about two years ago, federated across, and the one thing we wanted to have happen didn't and still doesn't, and it's enabling Find My. Is that yeah. going to be enabled? Or I, don't is that think still that's an, I don't think that functionality is enabled today. Okay. That's a file feedback question. Again, now that Apple started to put that controls in Apple Business Manager, that's a logical place, I think. Personally, I would like a dashboard where I could set, specify either organization-wide or on a per-group basis. You know, like, okay, these execs, they get all the, they get e-commerce feature, they get Find My, they get all this. General users don't get any of that stuff, but they get, like, iCloud keychains so they can leverage pass keys. Right. So, you know, I think we need that granular control. Yeah, because we're, we're looking, you know, for pre-K to 12, you know, basically third graders through 12th all have laptops, and you want to find where little Johnny, the fifth grader, left his laptop, um, but they can't because you can't enable it through that. Oh. Right. Yeah, definitely file feedback on that. Bueller. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Hey. Um, my question is around the uh, managed device assetation. Mm -hmm. um, we currently deploy our wireless network with a SCAT payload. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean with this change? Well, that'll still continue to work. But see, but correct me if I'm wrong. You probably have this where if you need to, if you need, to, if you need to have a cert for like Wi-Fi, right, and one for VPN and maybe one for 802.1x, you've probably got three certs on the device, right? Correct. Yeah. So that's another advantage of, of this approach, is that you can have you know because currently SCAP has to be tied in like a Wi-Fi profile or a VPN profile or an 802.1x profile or so on. So you can't have the same cert act as both. But with the, but with using the managed device attestation in Acme, you can. Okay. Now it's dependent upon your certificate provider, be it Microsoft or whomever, to support it. So that's probably where you start, and then your MDM provider also has to support it. So, but you're, what you have will continue to work. You can still keep using Skep for a long time, I'm sure, before that's deprecated. Any other questions? I had a question on uh, CUPS printer drivers. I know they've been deprecated for the last like few they're, operating systems. They're still deprecated. Still deprecated, but, but still they functional. still work. <laughs> I, I can 100% say they still work. You know, at some point, I think Apple wants to move to IPP entirely, and there'll be print providers to translate if you have non-IPP compatible printers. But I think also the, a lot of the non-IPP compatible printers are like falling off the end anyway. IT guys love printers. <laughs> Office space was very accurate. <laughs> Any other questions? Again, I think if you, you know, the, the, I think the big takeaway that I have from this is there's really a lot of meat in this update, maybe in small po pieces, but there's a lot of new functionality, a lot of things for you guys to test. So, and I know it's particularly those in education who where the summer is usually the time to get, like, get everything re-imaged and reset up and so on. It could be hard to find the time to test. Not to mention, you know, uh, running out iOS updates in September and macOS updates in October isn't necessarily the best timing for it. But, you know, you could, if, you, if you have the opportunity, at least even just put your own device on these things to learn and test and check with your MDM vendor and so on, you'll be much further ahead of the game than if you start in October. Well, if anyone doesn't have any questions, thank you very much for attending. I, I got to send the updated one to them. I got to fix the Ventura Sonoma part on there. Thank you.